I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman. I want to be successful. I want financial support. I want affordable health service. I want to be powerful. Powerful. Supported. Inspired. Connected. Educated. 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 I want specialized banking. I want maternal care. I want to be empowered. I am a woman. I am a king woman. I am a king woman. I am a king woman. I am a W woman. So everyone knows that King Woman was inspired by my mom. <laughs> she is my King Woman and she is the reason why this series started off in the first place. But even with that, this interview was probably one of the hardest I had to do. <laughs> and that is because even though I know a little bit of my mom's story, I was a bit nervous to share it with the world. But I knew I would have been doing an injustice to her life, an injustice to you, and even an injustice to me if I didn't ask the necessary questions that would give me honest answers. Enjoy. I was born into a family of six kids and uh, of course my parents. Both my parents are from Ibno, uh, the former southeastern state, uh, became Cross River State and now Akwaibom State. But uh, funnily enough, my parents left um, Ibno pretty early. I think my dad left at the uh, around 1940s and uh, went to Port Harcourt, worked also in Medjugorje and uh, also in Lori, uh, Kwara State. And my full name is Mayen Modukpeola Adetiba. Modukpeola wasn't given to me by Mr. Deli Adetiba. I had that name all along. As a matter of fact, to be quite frank with you, Modukpeola a date um, a shirt is actually what is on my birth certificate, not mine. The thing is that usually in my family, which is the Eshet's family, the parents don't name their kids. The names get sent to each of the parents by the grandparents. So my Parents, both my dad and mom, couldn't have named me when I was born. But they actually needed a name to put on my birth certificate. And since both my parents couldn't give me a name because they had not gotten the name from their own, uh, from my grandfather. So the nursing sister at the hospital decided to name me Mudukwe Ola. So I had Mudukpe Ola Eshet on my birth certificate. So that's how come I, uh, I had that name. Somehow, I must say that they are more cosmopolitan and very broad-minded. My dad, I've just told you, worked in uh, Port Harcourt, Meduguri, and uh, Ilori in the 40s and early 50s because I was born in 1951, and I was in Ilori. But before coming to Ilori, my dad had lived in Meduguri and worked with, uh, with the wife. Uh, uh, okay, I think he went to Meduguri before Port Harcourt, because my elder brother was born in Port Harcourt, and I was born in Ilori, and my other siblings, the other four siblings uh, were born at the at the Ikeja uh, Hospital in the 50s too. So um, my dad came out pretty early and uh, for a very long time that uh, Lagos was the only place we knew as home. We were not going to the village that often because I don't know why. Um, once in a very long while my dad would gather us, maybe once in 10 years or more we'll gather us and we'll go home, but it wasn't uh, a ritual like you see today. 
And anyway, going home those days wasn't exactly cheesecake. Because uh, I remember once when I was a little kid, yeah, and we went home, and we, were, we, we drove in my dad's car, and uh, we probably slept in the bushes, you know. You know, that was the kind of um, uh, rigors one had to go through in those days to get to the village, to go from Lagos to the east, you know, because, uh, of course, Ibno is in, uh, is in the uh, former eastern region. My dad, O N E Okonyakwa Eshet, uh, was a very funny and extremely intelligent guy. He was so so intelligent that anybody that came across him uh, would always comment on that. I think part of the reason my dad liked me very much was he thought I was a, another intelligent person, even though. I wasn't too good with reading. I could assimilate very fast. So he, I was like my dad's eyes, you know, and immediately you came in, he would let you know that I was his beloved mood. <laughs> that was how he used to call me. And my dad came from a family of about 13. There were, because the mother had three sets of twins, my grandfather was a fisherman, uh, which is the trade in that area, but a very, actually was about the wealthiest in his village. It was a very lucrative uh, business for him. My father was spoiled, really, very spoiled, because he was the first child and uh, there were just two of them who were, who were men, male from the 13. The second to the last and himself. Very good German. He was trained in, in West Germany. He didn't attach too much importance to money because when they did the, uh, when the government took over um, uh, the, the, the companies, or oh, Nigerianized the companies, um, some of these companies, particularly major and company, wanted him to be a director and he wasn't interested in that. He wasn't interested in the opulence of anything. He was a, a, a labor leader. As a matter of fact, my dad was the one that wrote the accord that set up the Nigerian Labor Congress as it is today, the NLC. He was the brainchild of my father. He wrote the accord. As a matter of fact, they went to bury somebody at Akbena, uh, one of the, the, the labor leaders. And at that time, they had different types of labor unions, TUC, ICUT, all those, with affiliation all over the country. And he said, why are we dissipating energies? Why can't we come together as one? This was at the Akbena. So that's why the, 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 the accord is called Akbena Accord. He was a commissioner in the Adebo Commission for Salary Reviews. He was not a friend to the government, I must say. I remember once uh, chatting with the former president, Ulushegun Basanjo, and I said, my father will be turning in his grave to see me hobnobbing with you people. Because as early as five o'clock in the mornings, most times uh, beginning of the year when the budgets are out, you find the, the, the states, the, 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 the secret policemen come surrounding our house to pick him up. So we always had a, a, at least a, a, cut, a, a packet of uh, corned beef, which my dad will take with him as the food while being, uh, uh, while being caged in the, at the Lions building, in, uh, which was then the force headquarters for the police. But you see, my dad and my mom were two different people. My dad was very vocal. My mother would, even in normal circumstances, be whispering to you about something rather than speak loud, you know. And she was very secretive. My dad was, was the opposite. 
He was somebody we loved gathering around when he's okay, when he's sober. And um, anything my dad would say, you want to laugh because of the way he would say it. We all had fun laughing when he was around. Only he wasn't too much, too much around, you know, but, and of course he did a lot of traveling. He was an international person. He was everywhere. Maybe that was where I took my liking of traveling. My dad traveled so much. That was very giving. As a matter of fact, to be quite frank with you, quite a number of people used to come to our house because they knew he would give. And dad would not hesitate giving even his last pounds at the, in those days because that was just the kind of person he was. My dad would go to the hotel and you find that he's feeding everybody in the hotel. They bought food and drinks on his account. It's usually his friend, uh, Mr. Connie Pratt, a lawyer, who had known my dad before my dad even married my mom, that uh, would go and probably cancel the order, assuming he got in there. And another thing about my father, he taught us something. He taught us how to say, I am sorry. My dad will say, I'm sorry, to his driver, to his house help. My dad will say thank you to, his, to anybody, just about anybody. My dad will say please to anybody. And you see, my husband used to think I was a phony because with my, my house help, I'll say please give me water to wash my hands and I will say thank you. At the same time, he would say, what's wrong with this fellow? Because he felt it was unusual. You have a house help, you are paying her, so it didn't matter. But that was some of the things we picked from my dad. My dad could even actually in those days sit down with his driver and, uh, and drink or eat. That was the kind of egalitarian person my dad was. Even though my father in those days was very important, his name could open doors. We didn't pay too much importance to it. He was just plain old Okon Eshet. Because he was spoiled by his parents, he, he indulged himself in drinking. This was a problem. And of course, when you drink so much, I don't think he also had the stamina to withstand uh, too much drinking. So he would be drunk. But you see, it was a bit worrying. And of course my mother was bothered that something could happen to him. Quite frankly, he, he tried to stop. It's only today I can appreciate it better that it's another form of sickness. We'll get mad at him. We'll be very, very upset, you know. There was even a time they say he had to go to Ozumba, Ozumba, or whatever the name is, that the man will cure him. He went, came back, he was playing one record, they gave him all the time in the house. He never cured him. We will get very upset and very mad. But you see, it's now that I'm a lot older, um, in, at my age, I can see it as addiction, sickness, which needed our sympathy more than us knocking him, you know. And that's why I'm very particular about any of my kids getting near it. After seeing what he did to my dad, none of us went near the bottle. All six of us, we ran away from it because it was bad. And of course, his drinking problems took a better part of his money. And I've also told you that in, the, in the, the, the club or wherever it is, which was the hotel setting, where people will flock around him and getting the money, him paying for everybody. And I'm not joking. The man will pay for drinks and food for everybody there. And that was his pattern. 
you know, and it was usually his friend that would save him because he can come and bump into it and then drive everybody away and say, no, you take that food away. Why? So that was it. At that point, he was not in control of what he was doing, of course. So that affected him. It affected all of us. We were worried. I was worried. You know, my mom, of course, that would give a, give a, knock their heads together because every woman wants to have a man who is always with, it, with her and without the problem, that particular problem. So it was a problem. My mom was not happy. She couldn't have been happy, you know, but my father, you know, my father was fantastic when you take away that, you know, he, and he, the man was so intelligent. He finished his Cambridge school cert at a very tender age, at the age of 16. In those days when some people hadn't started uh, primary school yet. When he did this Akbeno Accord thing, he was going to run as the first Secretary General of the Nigerian Labour Congress. And there was no doubt about it that it would have been probably someday the president of the Nigerian Labour Congress. My father, some years, flew in, he had traveled, he had gone abroad, came back and went to his office. I think uh, the, 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 there was what they used to call LMTS. It was the, uh, the government bus, public bus. The bus was parked somewhere in Yaba. And my dad, the driver was driving, he was going to his office. The conductor decided to drive the bus and he hit my dad's car. So there were shrapnels of uh, uh, glass into his uh, forehead and all those things. We didn't think much about it. So he started having knee problem, um, uh, problem with his uh, fingers and so on. So we thought it was from that, uh, that accident. Because my dad was a German trained, was German trained, he never went to any of the hospitals here. He would go to Sacred Heart Hospital in Abekuta. He would drive from Lagos because that was a German hospital. For a long time, they started treating him. After a while, they said it was arthritis. So in the 70s, I was at Columbia University in New York. He, he flew down to New York to see me and then went on to, at least, I think it was Atlanta uh, or so, Atlanta for some conference or meeting or whatever. When he got there, they had to fly him by air ambulance back to New York and admitted at the Cornell Medical Hospital. That was where they diagnosed his sickness as gout. Gout is a bit more serious than arthritis. And it was usually so bad that he won't be able to even walk to the toilet within the apartment in his house. That was how bad it was. My mother would probably uh, try to carry him on, the, on her back to the toilet. So I had two scholarships after my first degree to do master's PhD. I did my master's. I didn't feel like doing a PhD. I had the federal government scholarship. I had the Cross River State scholarship to do my postgraduate. I came back in 76, May. I think uh, this was 78, which was good. And it was a good thing I came back. What had happened, I was getting ready to go to the Netherlands. I was, uh, there was a company, a Dutch company, the, 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 the company I was working for, the late chief, uh, Fajemi Rukun's company. So they said I should go 
maybe for a couple of months training in Amersfoort in, in Netherlands. I didn't really want to. I said, I just came back. I don't want to. And they said, okay, instead of going for a couple of months, go for six weeks. So I was about to leave. I was pursuing my papers and my foreign exchange. Then it wasn't easy getting foreign exchange from Central Bank. He was down with gout. He, 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 the attack had come. And uh, I stopped by and he said, oh, by the way, if I die, will you come to my funeral? So I said, I mean, that's part of the... So I was, why wouldn't I come? I'll come, of course. He said, I want... Uh, uh, I want to be buried at home. I said, what's wrong? You mean all the uh, uh, fun uh, um, what burial grounds here in Lagos not good enough for you? He said, you know, that's the kind of banter I will have with my dad. You know, he said, no, but I didn't know that this man was going to die in a couple of days. You know, that was, uh, you see, I didn't know. So he said, I said, ah, you mean all the burial grounds here are not good enough for you, dad? You know, he said, ah, well, I'd like to be buried at home. And this was a man who hardly would go home. I think it was the following day or so, they took him to the hospital in Abekuta, you know, the, 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 the German hospital. My elder brother was coming in from the university uh, in, in uh, Ife, because he was now doing his PhD in Ife. So he, was, he came in with his friend to see him at the day thing. So he said to them, ah, he said, you know, last night, hmm, I saw Garden of Gethsemane. This was a man who doesn't even go to church. He said, ah, I saw Garden of Gethsemane. No. He said, ah, if they come again today, I will go, you know, just jokingly like that. And everybody laughed about it. You know, that's, that's my dad for you. And, you know, so everybody went home. Do you know the following day, the man was no, no longer there. That was how my father passed on. It was at night. My mother had come back. My brother, of course, came back with a friend. So he must have seen the Garden of Gethsemane again. So he decided to go. So, but they said, he said, so he talked a lot, probably in our dialect. So the nurses didn't actually understand what he was saying. But he did, I was told, he was quite verbal by the time he passed on. That was the first person close to me that had died. And I think I was a bit messy. And uh, luckily at that time, I was living with Mr. Ditiba. And um, I think I ran to his office. And I like slumped. And he said, oh, you take care of yourself. I mean, you hold yourself together and all that, you know. That probably was even a tip of the iceberg. Because soon after the, 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 the burial in the village, I had to come back and immediately left for my, uh, uh, the, the training I was supposed to attend in Netherlands. And it was so bad that I lost so much weight. I was frightened. And you see, in Netherlands, where I was staying was near this thick forest. I'll be looking under the trees to see if I could see, could find my dad, you know? But one thing that made me feel bold or much better, gave me a good feeling was that my dad loved me so much. Even if he appeared, it won't be to hurt me. He was that partisan. He was. It, he had absolutely no apologies about about being too being too much in love with this daughter of his. I'm carbon copy of my dad. The way I look is just the way my dad looks. As I took after my dad 100%. So. I'm, I'm, I'm equally as vocal as my dad.
you know, um, anything good and bad my dad had except for the drinking problem, I have it. And I have his physical this thing as well. To be quite frank with you, I didn't have a fantastic relationship with my mom. My mom was unnecessarily hard on me. In those days, it was very, very important that you trained your, your, your girl child in the proper way. First of all, even though we use, we normally have <clears throat> three to four house helps, my mother will insist that each and every one of us, including the boys, must learn how to keep the place clean, how to cook, how to do everything. As a matter of fact, my mother had this archaic idea that <clears throat> assuming I was the one to clean the sitting room and there was an ashtray there and I did not empty the ashtray, when she'd come back from work and find that ashtray dirty, I will be flogged. All others in the house will be flogged for seeing it and not emptying it and then reporting. Okay, she didn't do it. It wasn't your job. Well, why did you not do it? That was a kind of mentality my mother had. As a matter of fact, we were living not too far from Igbobi. We'll be playing surveillance, checking. Of course, you will have to walk from the hospital to home because it was very close. The moment we saw the uh, mom coming, everybody will be running, making sure the whole place was okay and tidy and all. The kind of thing I expect that you people were doing later, <laughs> you know. So my mother was a terror for us, for me in particular, because I, I, I got the... I was so much pampered by, by my dad, but my mom put me through a lot of hell. My mom also was particular about me being raised properly outside doing the chores. I must not be seen doing what I shouldn't do at that age. As a matter of fact, our slogan was, there is time for everything. I used to have secretly a boyfriend. In my fifth, final year, I had finished my school set. The fellow was at Igbobi College. So, in the dormitory, so he now stopped by to see me. Hey, my mother came in, saw the fellow in the sitting room. I mean, I had just finished my school set, for goodness sake. And at that time, I was 17 plus. My mother took a look at him. Who is this fellow? I said, oh, my friend. See, by, my, by the time my mother finished with him, he was taking, he was jumping three, four steps <laughs> to jump out of the house. That was my mother for you. My mother didn't mind you to go to Lagos. Okay, we, we, we lived near Igbobi, Igbobi College area then. If I were to go to Lagos, I mean, we, that used to be some of our hobbies. So we want to go to Leventis or UTC, listen to records and all that. My mother would say, hey, where did you take the, for, the, 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 the bus? If possible, what's the name of the, the, of the driver? Everything she wanted to know. But there was something I have never said before. My mother would even check to see if I was still a virgin. That was how bad it was. That was how strict my mother was. My mother would say, yeah, lie down, take off, and you'll do so. And that was the norm. Hey, okay, where well, is the Ivan, you know? It was the norm. So you see, to her, she wanted me to grow up in the fashion and manner that was set in those days. Those days you were not allowed 
to have any kind of sexual intercourse until we were married. It was a glorious thing to say, oh, my wife is a virgin. And so you as a mother, you must keep your kids in such a way that she will not get out and shame you. Okay? My mother was really strict with me. My best friend was a Bumi Adejobi from school, we from Form 1. And when we came out of school, we, the, the secondary school, we went, both of us went to Reagan, Reagan Memorial Baptist Girls School. And um, we, were, we, 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 we were most of the times together. Either both of us will be at my place or we will be at her place. If you saw me, you would see her. If you saw her, you would see me. So we were always together. I remember once, because my mother was so, so, so strict, I, I decided to write a love letter to her. And I say, do you know what, mom? I really don't believe you are my biological mother. I put it, sealed it in an envelope, kept it for her, and I ran away. I ran away to my friends, my girlfriend's place. So she never forgot that. Even, I think it hurt her. I think it hurt her because years later when I came back from the US, she brought it up again. But I didn't say it to make her, I didn't say it then to make her feel bad. It's just that I thought she was too, too strict on me and more so because she didn't have another daughter until when I was about leaving the country. Uh, my, my, my baby sister was too baby. Was, I, I, I helped to raise her, actually. She was number six. I was number two in a six uh, uh, family, kid family. So is my, 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 my mom didn't have another girl to kind of uh, um, look closely into what he or she was doing. So my, my, my baby sister got away with a lot. By the time she grew up, my mother was, of course, uh, much older, more experienced. I also was very, very, very tomboyish. A lot of people don't understand why I was so, but I grew up with the boys. I grew up with my dad and four boys playing football with them. I used to be the goalkeeper. My dad and my brothers will go, we go. We lived on a very huge compound at Ikeja then. And we'll go playing football. I'll go climbing trees with them. I'll go doing everything. So my mother used to have problems. The teacher will send for her and say, you know, what's wrong? This is your, 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 your daughter. She behaves like a boy. My mom will say, I'm sorry. She only has brothers. You know, you'll, you know, you'll try to appreciate the problem. You know, so that was my life. And that's why a lot of people don't understand me because that was my life. I grew up with the boys. I was playing football, climbing trees, and doing all the things the boys Of course, anything they did, I thought I could do. And, you know, you cannot then tell me that I now have to sit down, cross my legs, and uh, behave uh, like a lady. I'm not, and I don't have apologies for that. Because I, and I enjoy doing, being free. That's me. So there's nothing anybody can do about it. Even me, I can't do anything about it. When I got pregnant, I started moving closer to my mom. Before then, it wasn't because, you know, this, oh, you, you can't marry. But the moment it was done, she accepted whom I wanted to, because I said to them, including my father, that look, listen, 
I want to marry whom I love so very much. Because somewhere along the line, the man might start misbehaving. If I didn't love him too well, I'll pack out in Nejifi. My dad knew that that was where I was heading. I think once or so, we stopped by in his office and I introduced him to my dad. I said, okay, you know what? I want you to be happy. If that's what you want, okay. I just want you to be happy. But you know, my mom, moms will always want to tell you what to do and insist on it. So we fell out a little bit, I must say. We did because I wanted what I wanted. I was going to be the one to be in it, not my mom. So I insisted on doing what I wanted and who I wanted. Don't forget she was a teacher. Teachers must always discipline people. That is their stock in trade then. Not today when uh, they, they sell handouts and all those things. But teachers in those days were very particular about you turning out right. And my mother was every inch a teacher. My mom would always say something. Do not lie. If you lie, you will steal. If you steal, if you are a female, you will prostitute. You will be a prostitute. So those were always at the back of my mind. And she would also say, if you lie, you will look for more lies to cover the lies that you had lied earlier. So she detested lying. She will punish you because you lied about something rather than punishing you because you messed up something. If you destroyed something or you broke a plate, better to go and say, I'm sorry, mom, I broke a plate. If you lied and she caught you, you're, 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 you'll be punished for that. That was one thing about my mom. The second thing about my mom I learned, which is still, which is still very much with me. She will say her neck is much beautiful, much more beautiful than her body. She was a very contented woman. She did not want anything more than what she could afford. My mom made it a big problem to me that up till today, I don't know how to take loan from a bank and use it. When I came back from US, the in thing was for your company to give you money to buy a car. It was very much the in thing then. I never got any money from anybody to buy any of my cars. I always will go with my money. That, that means that would be a loan. So you pay over time. From day one, my very first car, I put down my money. Correct. Bought the car. Whether it's Toyota, whether it's Lexus, whether it's Mercedes Benz, I have never, never up till today bought anything on credit. When I was building this house, my friend who was then the managing director of Wema Bank, uh, SIA Digbite, came and saw the place. I said, oh, my, no, maybe you want a loan to finish this house. And I said, no, it's a big thing for me. You cannot catch me going to take anything on credit because as far as my mother was concerned, it was a taboo. You cannot do it. Well, this was, I think, in 1968. I just finished, um, I just finished uh, my school cert. 
and I was doing some freelance work at the Federal Radio Corporation uh, at Tikui. I was a freelance journalist, as I said. He was working there full time. He was a newscaster. Not that I hadn't seen him before. Of course, he was a newscaster. And in the dorm, we used to watch him read the news. Of course, he was a, a nice looking gentleman. Not now that he's so great. He was quite a, <laughs> he was quite a, you know, a nice chap. And I started doing some freelance work for the Radio Nigeria. And he had a girlfriend then, a young girl who was also working there, I guess. And they will, he'll bump into me. And when he bumps into me, you know, he had a way of, doing, of chasing women. He won't come direct, you know, he'll be coming. Hello, ma'am. <laughs> Hello, ma'am. I just say, this man, I beg, let him go, Jerry. This Sasha woman or whatever. You know, I wasn't excited about him. Not because I didn't think he was worth being excited over. He was a nice looking man, very nice looking. He was an extremely handsome man. There was no question about that. But then I, I looked at it that this handsomeness came with a lot of trouble. So I stayed away from it. I, was, I, I wasn't infatuated at all. But he wouldn't let me be. Even when he would be with his uh, then girlfriend, he will be trying. He will be trying to chat me up. As a matter of fact, there was a, actually a time he actually had to. I had to do an audition with him, being in charge of uh, running the audition for the for the for the radio corporation. So he tried very very hard, but I was not interested. I really was not interested. I don't, uh, well, I, I, I had a younger man, uh, my age, who, who also just finished at Igbobi College and was doing his HSE. And I, well, I wasn't interested in uh, Mr. Dittipa at, at that point in time, even though he was, uh, uh, he, he was uh, quite a, a good looking man. So, I, one day I had a recording to do uh, at uh, the, maybe it was uh, a drama, radio drama or something. So by the time I finished with the recording, I had agreed with my boyfriend who was doing his HSE to go to the Onikon Stadium for the, uh, they were do doing the, um, what was it called? The football for secondary schools then, you know. So I had ag agreed to go with him. And because I had never been to the, any stadium, I had on these big bell bottom trousers and another gaudy top, which I was. By the, by the time I got home, he had already left. So I thought, okay, I'll catch up with him at the stadium. So I put on this, my bell bottom and the top, and off I went to Nikon Stadium. I got to the stadium, there were heads of people. I, you know, sea of heads of people. I couldn't even make out where it would be. So I was, I was really overdressed for it anyway. And I was dressed as if I was going to a club rather than uh, Onikon Stadium to watch uh, the academicals, the academicals, as what they used to call it. So as I was standing there, a bit uh, shivering, uh, embarrassed, here walked in Mr. Detiba on the, he said, hello, ma'am. Ah, I was so happy to answer back this time around. Hello, ma'am. And I said, hello. And uh, we started just and uh, he said, oh, you came, and we, of course, one thing led to the other. Then he now said, okay, I'll take you home to your home, you know, 
I can see you to your home. I jumped at him. When you love somebody, you must love what is anything he comes in with. That's what makes, and don't forget that I got to know Bolandi since when she was a, a, a little kid. So, yes, I'm, I'm not the biological mother, but once I'm married to the dad, I must, you know. So, from, from the onset, she was as, as well as my daughter than as any other person. Yes, I know that you felt that way, but really, I couldn't have, if I love the father so much, I must also love the daughter. That's the only way you can um, have peace in the house. Because if you claim you love the dad, you must love the kid. There mustn't be any difference between your kid and the one he brought in. So that was exactly what I tried to do. And I'm happy I was able to achieve that because I didn't, at no time did I want it to be any other way. If it had gone any other way, there is no way I would have had the kind of relationship I had with the dad. So you must embrace any, including the family. So not, not just the kid alone, the family. The brother, Muiwa, was as good as uh, my own junior brother. You know, so that's, that's the philosophy. There is no way, you must understand one thing. When a man has a child, except a stupid man that will not be close to that child, so you must, from the very beginning, make sure you love both of them or all of them. That's the only way you can be happy and have a happy home. My immediate brother was in England. He died in England. You know, there was some altercation, with, you know, which happened that he lost his life. And that was soon after my dad died. And that was very painful to my mom. The unfortunate thing is that he had sent a letter to my mom before he died. And my mom hadn't gotten the letter. My mom was still, because she would send money to him, I would add money to what he was, she would send, and we send money. I had come back from US then. So they, they, we sent money to him. She had sent money to him. And uh, for two, three months, we were looking for how to tell my mother that she had lost a son. And while we were waiting, his letter came, and the woman was uh, elated, you know? Like uh, people say the Yorubas are the, nobody knows that the mess is smelling in your body because my mother was elated. He got a letter from the, the, from the son, not knowing that he had passed on. But we were waiting for one of my aunties to come from Uyo at that time for us to be able to break the news to her and for somebody to stay at home with her when we would be at work. <clears throat> so we waited, we waited one month, two months. The third month, she was able to come. So we now approached, you know, her pastor. The pastor came, we were all there, I mean, we started dropping in and we were all there. And the man <laughs> started crying. No, he said, let us pray. And it was in the prayers he told my mom that the, the son had died, you know. And it was so, you know, I think he too didn't know how to handle it. 
but the 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 the, 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 the it was you know I actually believe that these were the things that contributed to my mother dying, dying at the time she did, because she didn't want to continue to bury her kids. She has lost her husband. She has lost the first, uh, the number three son, number three child, a son, number four child came. It was a good thing my mother died because by the time my elder brother, Dr. Nat Eshet, was a, a, a PhD holder, when he died of heart attack, you know, I think that would have finished my mom completely because my mother was very close to him. And I told you that even my brother had to give up schooling in Nottingham in the UK to come up to come home so that I would be closer to my mom because they were they were two of a kind they they really really loved each other you know just the same way I was with my dad my elder brother and my mom were pretty close and we all knew that so it was a good thing my mother left before he died because I, I cannot fathom what I would have done to console her. It would have broken her heart so much. The second one, he had trained in India as an automobile engineer. So he came in, worked for SCOA in their maintenance shop. Then um, the paramount ruler of our country, or the village head of my mother's country, our mother's village, invited him over because there was mobile, mobile is in my mother's village. The Kwaibo terminal is in my mother's village. And they, of course, have, uh, they used to have a lot of buses and cars which they would want to fix. So the village head in my mother's village wanted to, uh, decided to team up with my junior brother to set up a company. At that time, my mother's village was an island to my father's village. And the mobile staff used to access their offices, their office in my mother's uh, uh, village through a pontoon. I was one of those who actually pushed and pushed and pushed mobile until they built a road and bridge connecting the mainland to the island where they are. You know, it took me a while, including the, that village head, we had to talk to mobile, plead with them, uh, box them into a corner until they finally built that. So he had come to the mainland to visit friends and uh, had a few drinks and he was going back to the island and of course he was going in a boat in a boat uh, these wooden boats he had quite a lot of these wooden boats that would ferry them from each end so he got down and sat down in a boat not quite 300 uh, um, 300, 300 feet, the boat capsized. I was um, on a tax force for the government at that time uh, to prepare the, the paper for the industrialization of the country, Nigeria, at that time. So we were having some meetings at a co-hotel. We had, I had just gone checked in there. So somebody called me as soon as I checked in to say that my, my brother had died. At that time, they had not even seen his corpse. They knew there was this, that the boat had capsized. Some people were not found. Some were picked up. So they called me. So I called my elder brother 
and we all got together. Luckily, he was in Lagos then. My mom was at home. So I came home and my mom was looking at me. She didn't know what was wrong and she felt, ah, maybe she's having a problem with the husband. I said, man, you know, look at your kids. Why are you worried? This is, this is. Don't worry now. Eh, whatever he's doing, don't worry if he's, uh, look at, just look at your kids and find happiness. And I just looked at the woman and shook my head that she didn't know that she was the one being hit very much. So we didn't know how to break the news to her. My brother came, I came, we got ready. So eventually we had to tell her that, look, listen, we have, we have to go home because, because, because. And you know, that was when I said she just refused, refused any kind of uh, injection, you know, because she said she wanted to feel it the natural way. And we got home. By the time we got home, they still hadn't found the body. body. I think it was the following day they found the body and it was already bloated and we didn't we couldn't even recognize him so we had to stay my elder brother and I got him ready and like the tradition demanded we had to bury him near luckily he had a plot of land my grandfather had given him which was near to the water and we buried him there we tried to make her happy, but, and I think she found, actually, with, with the second, with, with that kid, we did something different. We brought in all the grandkids before they told her. So she would see this one drop, ah, she was so happy. Oh, she was like, ah, look at all the grand grandchildren have somehow found their way to the house, not knowing that we were preparing her for, for, what, for eventuality. So all the grandkids, we brought them in. They were dropping by. We made food and everything. And so when, when they told her, and she wanted to really feel bad, we said, look at your grandchildren. They are all here. Turn around, look at look at Kemi, look at uh, Junior, look at Remy, look at uh, Ma. You look at your grandchildren. That helped her because with the grandchildren around her, that gave her a little bit more energy that, oh, okay, maybe there's something I need to live for. But really, I don't believe you can quite take her out of it. The experience, I think, for her was horrible, was terrible. There was uh, the annual conference of Zonta International in the Philippines. No, no, not in the Philippines. It was in Hong Kong. The Nigerian delegation came in when I got to uh, Hong Kong, I was there a couple of days before the delegation from Nigeria came in. And there were uh, some of my elders, my seniors, but my good sisters, my good friends, they came in, they said, oh, Maya, you've been in Hong Kong for so long, take us to all the places you've been to, we want to buy this, we want to buy that. First day we went, it was okay. Second day, it was terrible. And in the evening, we had uh, the banquet for the, for the conference. I could not even open my eyes. My head was as if they were slicing my brains. It was so, so, so bad. All through the dinner, all I had was paracetamol. I couldn't even eat. It was so bad. 
do you know the following day the whole thing just disappeared as if nothing happened i had thought maybe i had caught some you know because the first time i went to china with mr detiba i stayed away from the chinese fruits because i thought they were using human manure to grow their fruits so i didn't touch it but this second time i decided to buy a pen knife and i would peel off the entire uh, outer portion and eat so i thought maybe i had been contaminated i had been infected with something so but the following day i was okay even though down the headache had gone it was then i flew home when i got home um mr detiba was at the airport and uh, i got home he said oh your mom is not feeling well i said eh? that was at the at the at the no at the airport i said oh let's stop by at the airport uh, at the eco hospital because i mean that was the hospital she used eco hospital i said oh like, on our way let's stop by now of course nobody answered me so when i got home mr detiba was like uh, wanting to embrace me or kiss me. i said what's wrong with you so let's go to the hospital to let me go and see my mom i didn't know that my elder brother and so my one of my aunties were in the next flat because we used to have like two flats together it was in the next flat wait hiding and waiting so mr detiba was trying to uh, do whatever then i said Child, let's go to the hospital now why is it so tell me then he was ah. i said don't tell me my mother is dead oh. then she, he said he just nodded and i yelled it was the yelling that i yelled that my elder brother and my auntie from the following flat came and rushed in and i just and i felt this emptiness i had never felt that bad and i was told that she kept on saying oh tell her that i waited for her and i thought she was coming on so 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 did oh, my mother was sick sick maybe she too so uh, yeah, what what i'm 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 a get on or like the husband and decided to go but actually she did actually she did because the the people who cared for her said she was just going down and they would bring food for her and they would say and she would say if you if you saw what i've seen you won't bring me this food you know she was seeing the other side of course i expected my mother to say that because she was a local preacher she was a lay reader she was uh, she was so much into the lord not my dad but my mother yes she was very spiritual you know and uh, so she she really was in that mood she was probably taking over she was prepared to go she was not very ill she just got into the hospital and the next minute she went into coma and that was it. not that she was ill about anything she wasn't pro- i mean my my baby sister who was then working uh, for, as a uh, working for central bank had just gone on a trip if my mother weren't feeling well she wouldn't have gone came back just to hear that the mother had gone and that was it you know so both my my parents went in a, a very dramatic way which i can't understand all i told her was shame on you you couldn't even wait for me to come back i said shame on you mommy shame on you should have waited for me to come back shame on you and i didn't see her but an eyelid but uh, it was it was i i I would have loved to be there when uh, she passed on. I would have loved to be there. Interestingly, I didn't start up wanting to be an engineer. I think um I, I, since age 9 I wanted to be an accountant. 
but that would have been a very, very boring uh, profession for me as I have come to see today what, what the job of an accountant and uh, how posturous I am. I wouldn't have fitted in properly. So, but I, I had dabbled into a lot of things when I left school. Um, of course, that was how I got to meet Mr. Detiba. My plan was, uh, was for me to go to uh, Virginia, West Virginia, because I had gotten admission to the school there. And what really happened, it was soon after the war. The war had just, uh, as, had just finished and uh, it was very difficult. As a matter of fact, it was against the law to send out money. You just didn't have money. It was a crime to send out money. I had to work. I had to work in the industry. I had to work in the factories. I had to work in Kentucky Fried Chicken. I had to, you know, I did odd jobs and I also did babysitting. But that was much later when I got into Columbia University. Remember that I wasn't supposed to end my journey in New York. But money wasn't coming, so I couldn't go to the school in West Virginia. West Virginia from New York would be maybe another couple of hours, two, three hours from New York. So I was stranded in New York. Again, I went as a tourist. I was also looking for how to change my uh, visa because I didn't wait to get my student's visa, even though I was already uh, admitted in a school in West Virginia. When I realized that money was not forthcoming, and I started doing some little things in, in, in New York, I now said, okay, let me go to the, there was some program, some school that taught computer programming in, in the Empire State Building. Empire State Building at that time was the tallest building in the world. So I started taking this course in computer programming at the Empire State Building. From there, I now registered at the New York University, taking some courses at NYU. I did one semester. Then I met uh, Walter of Naguru, who was Minister for Information. Uh, he was at Columbia University. He was doing his uh, doctoral program there. And he said, oh, why don't you come to our university? That was how come I applied to go to Columbia University. There was Walter of Anoguru there. There was uh, uh, Adeniron, who is also uh, a stalwart at PDP. The, in New York at that time, you had Laz Ekweme, you had uh, Obiora. There was also the Obio Furniture, who was also uh, one of those in New York at that time. So I now applied to Columbia University. Don't forget that I was already developing interest in computer science. So when I went to Columbia, I applied to Columbia University, I wanted to read computer science instead of engineering. When I went into programming, I wasn't thinking per se. It was just what was available to me at that time. And it wasn't really a degree course it, uh, at the, the Empire State Building. Don't forget at that time they had these mighty uh, computers that could fill a whole room. And for you to uh, access them, you needed the program, uh, to somebody to punch programs on the cards. And that was what was used in driving them. So I went to learn computer programming, which was to punch on the cards. So 
really, I cannot really say that there was something that really fascinated me into it. Maybe that was what was just available then. And don't forget, when I went to NYU, I wasn't going into the engineering school there. I was just taking some courses. I didn't really know what I was going to do. It was when I went, applied to the school of, uh, to the school of engineering in Col to Columbia University that I said, okay, I want to do computer science. It so happened that computer science then was under the school of engineering. It wasn't a faculty on its own. When I got there, they got to know that I'm, I'm a Nigerian. There was a Nigerian in the faculty of engineering in the in electrical electronics department, which computer science was also under. Computer science was under the electrical electronic department. So they invited him to see me. And he looked at me and I said, you know, his name was uh, Engineer Ojo. And he said to me, you know, you know what? Why don't you go in for electrical engineering instead? Electrical engineering? Okay, okay. So I now changed from computer science to electrical engineering. So I did the first two years and in a, a university like Columbia University, as you come in, they give you career counselor. That's what they, they were called. The career counselor will be looking at your progress and be pointing you into a direction that they believe you are more suited for. So whether or not you want to be a medical doctor, your career counselor will be looking at you. If he sees that that's not your field, he will just let you know very early. Well, so he's looking at your strength and your weaknesses and using that to advise you as to where to go. So after like about two years, and it, I was now ready to go into the core subjects. My career counselor invited me. And he said to me, he said, look, listen, you are from a third world country. The area of electrical electronics is extremely volatile. I will advise that you probably go into civil engineering, civil structures, because it's more stable. If you are in electrical electronics, there will be the need for you to have continuing education very often. And we can see it. Every two, three months, uh, the Samsung uh, or the iPhone is coming out. Those are, uh, there's a new uh, whatever. That is exactly what the man was saying. And there is need for you to update. In civil structures, it's much more stable. But in electronics, it's not. It's very volatile. And coming from the setting that you are coming from, you do not have that facility for you to be upgrading yourself from time to time that I would rather advise you that you went into uh, civil, civil structures. That was how come after about two years, I changed from, don't forget, I came in wanting to be a computer scientist. They spoke to me and uh, I got into electrical electronics and my career counselor also advised me to move into something less volatile. So I went into civil structures, and I must tell you that I think I enjoy it very much. I wouldn't say that I wouldn't have enjoyed being an electrical electronics, but from what I see, I think I, 
I made the right choice. I, I so much enjoy being a structural engineer. When I got into Columbia, I got a job on campus uh, in, the, in, the, in, this, in the School of Journalism. They put out daily papers. So I was working in that press. And I was so good at what I was doing that within a question of like a month, I got raised, I got incremented my salary more than two times. Okay. And then in the, the other, at other times, when I have, when I can fit those in, I'll babysit. There was a service being rendered by a, a, the, the school there where students could babysit for those who had been to all these colleges. I used to go to Bernard, get some, uh, uh, what do you call it, some of these uh, jobs that could go up to like uh, 11, 12 at night because uh, they were probably out doing, going for dinner or whatever. So that also helped. But I think the most interesting one, which I did, was I was the very first female student to be security guard in the, uh, uh, in the dormitories. I was a student during the daytime, mostly to also help students. You, you had the dumb facilities being manned, the security being manned by students. It's only in the evenings and at nights that you had the real uh, professionals, uh, security guards, because all we did mostly during the daytime is to check and make sure you had your ID before you could come in, make sure the, 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 other, the people that were not supposed to come in didn't, they didn't come. I was working hard. I was working two, three jobs. I was taking more than the normal um, student will, will, would take. I was taking sometimes 24 credits because uh, the average, some average students, they take just 12 credits. Sometimes I take from 20 to 24. And that was why I finished in such a short time. But at the same time, I was doing a lot of work. So really, Sometimes I marveled how I was able to do it. But one thing I did not sacrifice on was taking my holiday. During summer, I like to shut down on everything, take my time, go to Europe, and go from countries to country. And that's why I've been able to say I've seen about 80% of the world today. When I finished my first degree, I got a, two scholarships. One from the then Southeastern State, uh, is it Cross River State, because that's where I happened to be from. And then the federal government also gave me another scholarship to do up to a PhD level. That means a master's and a PhD. I came back, but I found out that oh, mentally and everything, I was not there. Because I was getting so close to my boyfriend again, that the boyfriend I left in 1978 was beginning to, we were getting closer and closer and closer. It became difficult for me. So he pleaded, he more or less pleaded with me to finish, manage and finish your master's. And by the next flight available, I was back home. My dad got me a job with the company, uh, the, the company being owned, that was owned by the former vice president of the nation, uh, Ch uh, architect Chief Alex Ekweme. It was called Structure So I started working there. And it was a huge company because we had expatriates, we had like cells. You had the major engineer, and then junior engineer, and you have draftsmen. And because it was in this, is it UPE program, which uh, 
they had to create a lot of second uh, uh, schools um, and he, him being the vice president had a lot of jobs so you have most of these senior engineers they were all from India or Asia but then there was this discrepancy in everything they were paid a lot more than we were because they were expatriates and I think the, the way they treated these engineers looked at us it was like we were uh, coffee girls to them and having lived through some of these in in US I wasn't prepared to go through that again and I just looked at it I didn't tell my dad my dad had his office there in that same complex I didn't tell my dad I just checked out and I got myself a job with the late Chief Henry Fajer Miroku, who happened to have been my dad's friend. So I just left and started working with uh, uh, Niger Consult. It was uh, the other one was Structenge, and uh, that's the one for Chief Alex Equipment. So I now moved on to Dr. Uh, Dr. Henry Fajer Miroku's uh, firm. I was a young girl, I was in my tw late 20s or something, but I would always attend meetings. He had a lot of expatriates. We'll sit down in a very long boardroom, finish the meeting, but he found out that I was always too outspoken. What others won't say, I will say. I would tell him the way I felt. So the man got to a point that any time we finish the meetings, he will ask everybody else to leave, including the expatriates, and said only Mrs. Shet should stay back. And we'll start another discussion, just the two of us. It was sad because uh, I was still in his employ. Actually wanted to do, you had at that time, he was bringing in another factory or where they will make precast members. That is, uh, members that you use already cast. You just go and fit them. It's just like a model. Fit them on the side. And he made me one of those in that to take vital decisions in that company. And he just went. We just had a meeting not long. He, two three days later, he went to another West African country. The next thing we heard he was dead. That really affected me because I was already getting into a, a position whereby the, the, you, you, you saw somebody who felt he could make something out of you, who, who trusted you, who thought you were brave enough to face him. I mean, I, really, I, do, I don't know whom to... I, Dr. Henry Fajer Miroku was a colossus. He was, he came out, he looked majestic. He was, he was rich. He was, uh, he, he had the charisma, he had everything. So really, when he died, something in me left because that was somebody whom I knew uh, had so much, uh, could have had a lot of influence on me. And he had a lot of companies. As a matter of fact, one of my first major projects was done under his, uh, with his company. And that was, um, I think they call it Festac 77 Hotel now. That hotel at the, as, as Festac wasn't meant to be an hotel. It was meant to be the houses for legislators, to house the legislators. But it was a big room with some facilities. But then, when it was concluded, the legislators said they couldn't stay there. 
because they will have more than one wife and whatever. So how would you fit them in there? So that was how it was converted into a hotel. I was the resident engineer at inception in that particular project, which was frightening for me because I was a greenhorn and I was supervising expatriates. I had the, the contractor for that building project was the contractor at that time who was building Hilton Hotel all over the world. And they were there in full force. So I had to be supervising their supervisors. First of all, a young woman in the 70s, we are talking about 1970, late 76, 77, it's early 77. How would you have a female engineer come and tell you? Even in America, it was scarce. It was rare. You didn't have female engineers being in charge of anything at that time on a project site. They were supposed to take instructions and go ahead, not just instructions. But what that forced me to do was to read heavily at night when I came back because I needed to be very good in order to give them the right instructions. I didn't want to look stupid, okay? Initially, they will come, normally before any casting is done or anything is done, the contractor must ask the resident engineer for approval. Say, assuming they want to do some casting. You check the reinforcement as a resident engineer, and if that was okay, you give them approval to do the casting. Initially, they were not coming back to me for that approval. And I kept on warning them. I said, no, you know, I have to give you the approval. And each time I'll come back, they'll do the same thing. So I said, OK, I will show you Pepe. One day I got in there. They had done the same thing. So normally, they're supposed to have site instruction uh, book on site. And I know my power. I know my rights. So I just put their stop work. Bam, signed, left. By rights, nobody, they cannot change that. So they had to stop the work, and that was the beginning of sanity on that side. And they would never do anything except I gave them that go ahead. I've checked, I'm taking full responsibility for it. Now you can go ahead and cast. So. That put paid to that, who are you? You this uh, black monkey or you this woman? So I put paid to that. But again, like I said, I had to properly uh, read up a lot of things in order to make sure that I was well abreast in what uh, we were doing on site. I was forced into opening shop my, for myself. I worked for a couple of companies. I worked for a Dutch firm, you know, because when late Chief Fajr Mirokun died, he was at, a pro, at the verge of merging with a Dutch company called DHV. They do all the Heineken's uh, uh, factories all over the world. And they did the MBL. So part of the structures in MBL were done by me. As a matter of fact, Ibadan Brewery at that time, I don't know about now, was the second largest in Africa. And 60% of the structures in Ibadan Brewery were done by me. When I wanted to become uh, a member of the Nigerian Society of Engineers. One of those who interviewed me, oh, uh, engineer Ogushola, was part of Adejum Ogushola and partners. I think he just pulled out. 
So he, he invited me to start work with him. Like I said, I wasn't, I didn't think I was prepared to go on my own. In 1983, I think there was a recession in the country. So engineer Ogunshola felt, whom I was working for, I was an associate partner with him at that time. And at that time I was about, coming close to about 10 years, about eight, nine years, eight, eight, eight years in the profession. He felt there was not going to be jobs to sustain him keeping me in the, in the, in the, because I was earning good money then. At that time, 20,000 was a lot of money. And my salary was actually 20,000, which was completely out of what people were paying then. So he felt he couldn't pay me that money at that time because there was no, uh, no way he could, uh, he, he, he was sure he would continue to get jobs. So that was how I had to leave. And because I didn't see who would give me that kind of money or employ me and pay me that kind of money, I decided to set up my own company. So that's why I said it wasn't because I wanted to leave. No, I could have still been working with someone for some time before setting up on my own. But at the time that happened in 83, it was difficult to find well, I assumed it would be difficult for me to find somebody who would pay me that kind of money. So I decided to set up on my own. I was beginning to get exposed to people, to going in search of jobs, to going to pick up, uh, or, uh, to pick up uh, a, a fees when I was with Ogunshola and Partners. The first time he went abroad, he was a bit nervous. He wasn't sure I'd be able to handle the office at his absence. Don't forget, this was 81, 82. I think I started with him 82 or thereabout. And 81, 82 or thereabout, I'm not sure. You know, so he was a bit nervous, but he came back and he was telling everybody, all his friends, how fantastic I was in manning the office during his absence. So that gave him more confidence in giving me more responsibilities. So I was already an associate partner with Okushola and Partners. So I now started taking up more and more responsibilities. At the time that it became obvious that I could no longer stay there because he wasn't certain he was going to get jobs, I had already built up enough confidence in myself. So I started going out to hunt and to look for jobs. And I must say that I thank God that I have never stayed without without a project i don't know why but i can i will always thank god for it i've never i try to think and see when i was without a job i've never seen that but as a matter of fact i was the first female engineer to set up a civil structural engineering company engineer mrs uh, olumaduka was the first female to set up uh, 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 a consulting firm. I was uh, the second female engineer to set up a private company. You know, she was the first. But in construction, I was the first to set up a construction firm. I used to run a construction firm as well. You know, so I set up a consulting firm and I was the second to set up a female consulting firm. And I was the first to set up a female contracting firm at that time.
interestingly, I as a person, I didn't have too many problems. Others had problems, even of employment. They, we had to set up uh, the Association of Professional Women Engineers in Nigeria, APWEN, of which I was the chartered secretary. Mrs. Matuka was the chartered president. And that was because most of our women had problems getting jobs. When they would go out soliciting for employment, they would be told that, look, you're supposed to be in the kitchen. I never had that. Nobody told me that. I must also say that um, I think I really can recollect job-wise where I had problems per se. One thing, one thing I used to hear a lot about me was that I was too finicky. Yes, I heard that. It was like, oh, you are too finicky, you are too finicky. Well, I'd rather be finicky than be sloppy. And I must also say that uh, I went after my job with a lot of gusto. I was telling somebody I can't remember ever taking maternity leave, ever. I had three kids. I would work still the very day I would I'd go to the hospital, have my babies and get back to work. So I'll take the normal leave. So as a result, I was never paid half salary because the norm then was you'll be given half salary, you'll take six weeks before, six weeks after for your... But I was working till the very last day. And similarly, even though I was pregnant, I would climb up the, uh, the, uh, the, the scaffolding easily, you know. so. I did my job the way I'm supposed to do my job. So I was very particular about what I needed to do. You will fault me on overdoing the job, not underdoing. I will not come and tell you, sorry, I want to take my kid to the hospital, or I need to. That wasn't me. I may be a bit brutal about that, but. I didn't see that as being responsible. So I'd rather wait till after office hours, except I have very, I have a, an emergency. I will not take out time to take my kid to the hospital. I would rather wait until maybe after work and then do those things. So because I was, um, I think I took my job seriously. What I have come to see and appreciate is the fact that the attitude of work, uh, attitude to work of a lot of Nigerians leave a lot to be desired. They are very sloppy. For me not to engineering, I believe, particularly civil structural engineering, which is what is my field. When there is a failure, it involves lives. And that's what I tell my people. When you have a structural failure, you must appreciate the fact that it could take a lot of lives with it. If you have an architectural failure, say what we call half landing, that is the one you get to before you get to the Maybe you hit your head. You'll probably use hot water and, 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 and fix it. It's a different, keto, a different kind of failure, architectural failure, a, a, a different kind of failure. But let a building collapse and some people are there. We just had one a few days ago. You'll be bringing out bodies. You'll need body bags. So, in order not to expose yourself to such uh, an experience, you must be exceedingly careful. You must be very careful. I tell my people over and over again, you have to be very, very careful. 
because lives could be involved. And woe betide you if you should experience such a thing. I believe you'll never recover out of it. You come out of it. You'll never recover recover from it. Because you'll you'll be it will be coming back in your mind how you have been the cause of failures that lives were taken. How do you live with yourself? So that makes it for me and not just that, I think it's also part of me. I am finicky. I'm less finicky now that I'm older. But yes, I was very particular. Your eyes must be dotted, your T's must be crossed. Because the way I see it, at the end of the day, your presentation, your presentation, your work presentation, is a mirror image of you. If you're a careless person, you can easily see it in what you do, in your letters, in all those things. If you're a careful person, you can also read that in your work. You know? So that's why I always tell my people, my workers, you have to, the book must stop with you. Don't tell me, oh, it's the other fellow. What I do, I would check drawings, after they would have checked, when the draftsman in those days would finish uh, doing the amendments, I would check again. I would even check the borderlines to see that the names are properly put. put the, the, the comma is where it's supposed to be. That is aside from the engineering drawings. So it's important for you to do the right thing. To you know, so yes. I plead guilty to the fact that I am very particular, I'm finicky, I'm, I, I need things to be properly placed. And it's not only in engineering. I think I'm so, and it's because of the kind of training I also got from my mother, because she believed that things must be done properly. You have to know that the job must be done and it has to be done in a good way. You know, <clears throat> when you have serious problems, when you have genuine problems, yes, I'm prepared to listen to you. But when you have people who come under the using, I'm a woman, I'm a female to cover up some inefficiency, then that I cannot, uh, I, I, I don't think we should condone. Yes, when, when, when you must be able, even, if you, even for men too, they could have some problems that one should be prepared to listen. But don't use womanhood to hide inefficiency. And you know it could happen. It could happen in this climb or any climb. You go to America, nobody will listen to you. Again, that could be part of the reason I, I I do my work the way I do it. I say my job the way, I, because you know too well, in US nobody cares. You put in as much as the other man does. I believe a woman, first and foremost, is a human being and should be treated as such. And I also believe if you do same work, and I've seen many women who are doing better than men, they should be paid equally. I don't believe that uh, a, ma a woman should be paid less than a man because she's simply a woman. I'll tell you a story. When I was in this Dutch company, DHV, I I think it was my first year. And then I got to know that I was not supposed to enjoy the same medical uh, facilities as my male counterpart. Boy, you could have seen me that day. I couldn't even control myself. I marched into the managing director's office and I literally was vibrating. And I said, look, I have gray matter like everybody 
I, I was not employed as a female engineer, but as an engineer, and I need you to give me what is due me, just like my male counterpart. I was vibrating. I didn't even know. I couldn't even control myself. Ah, I th I, I, the man double <laughs> immediately. The, 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 the Dutch uh, managing director immediately gave me what I was doing. You know, I don't believe in that because I know I can give you as much work, if not better. There are some women who are much, much better than men. For whatever reason, they can articulate better, they can be a lot more careful at what they are doing, they are, they are not as careless as men. So they can give you at the end of the day a better product. Why then do you mark them down? Why then do you give them less? I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. And I was not raised to believe in uh, a woman being inferior to a man. My father did never believed in it. I was always up there. So nobody could, nobody could put me down and I don't put any woman down. Oh, for goodness sake, if any woman, uh, let me say attractive women, because I would want to believe that I'm not so bad looking, you know, you would always have that. But it is for you as a woman to know where you want to put yourself, in, how you want to place yourself. That will always come. It's, it's all, it, well, not now, I'm probably too old to be told that. When I was younger, yes, I, 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 I had uh, from people in authorities, politicians, all those ministers, whatever, you name them, presidents, whatever, you name them. But it is for you as a woman to know How do you want to be seen? What, what do you want to be respected? Because it depends on the way you carry yourself that people take you. If you believe by doing all kinds of things, getting all kinds of favors uh, by doing those things you're not supposed to do, that's what will favor you, fine. But I must tell you, if you carry yourself properly, if you carry yourself properly, yes, people, they will, they will respect you. The people, the, these same men will respect you. Any woman today, whether in Nigeria or anywhere, you have to be, to work twice as hard as a man to get to where you're going. It's not easy. You must work twice as hard as a man. But I would say I've been, by the special grace of God, I've been so favored. I have been very much favored. And I thank God for that. The thing is that a time will come that you won't have to work that hard. Don't, don't you forget we are trying to break into areas we were not there. It's very rare before you find women be full-time housewives these days. It's not that they are not there, but that used to, that never used to be them. You know, being out there working was not uh, was not the, work, uh, the norm. I must tell you, when I was growing up, women were not driving cars. As a matter of fact, when I started driving my dad's car, there were no women driving cars. And we are talking about a lifetime not too far from yours. Women were not driving cars, period. We are beginning to venture into some arena where we were not. Don't you, you have to also see it from this point of view. As we are beginning to get into this 
sphere, these areas that we were not there. We were not bringing in money. The men are also losing. It's difficult for them. They are beginning to get women who are demanding for their rights, who are bringing in money. So they are faced with a problem. They used to be the king of the house. They used to be the lord and master. They come and say, this is Satan, it was that. They have to now shift, to start shifting grounds. Try to cede some of their, what used to be their rights to the women. Again, these are things you have to look at. These are things we have to empathize with them for. Maybe the younger ones of today uh, are not going through that drastic changes. People your father's age group, it's a bit difficult for them because their own father, their, their wives must never must not even, there are some must not even sit here where the man is. Just bring the food and get into the, into the bedroom. It's a transition. It's a, the people, we are moving from one stage to the other, to the other, to the other. You younger ones, you don't know what it used to be like. You cannot appreciate it. Those of us who have one leg here, one leg there, we can tell you that Ah, it's not cheesecake. The Nigerian women, just like other women, we are, we, we, we've made, um, we've achieved quite a bit. There is still a lot to be done. Because for men to accept, to see it, or to see you as somebody, as a partner, it's not easy for them. It's not easy. Whether, you know, particularly those who are up to their 40s, upwards, 50s, or whatever, it's not easy. I don't believe anything has to suffer. Again, it depends on the individuals. Don't forget that we are not all cut out the same way. I like being under hyper hypertension. I mean, hyper pressure. You see, I think it's my own DNA that favors that. When I'm not under pressure, I'm like sulking. I must be, you know, that's me. Even at my age today, I feel very upset if I'm not, you know, give me something to take me, maybe all night. I was talking to somebody when I was very angry with him about some, you know, thing that needed to have been done. I was on the site for three days. In, under the rain, sun, all I was doing is changing workers. And that's the kind of thing I enjoy doing. I'm not a typical engineer, I must say so. And please don't use me to, as a yardstick for measure for other engineers. I'm an engineer. I'm a workman, uh, whatever, all rolled into one. So I don't do a typical engineer's work only. I can also do the job of a laborer on site. It doesn't faze me at all. I don't feel anyhow about it. I enjoy doing it. I believe I'm getting, I'm working out. If I'm doing that, I'm doing some exercise from doing physical uh, um, work on site. You know that on this site, I work very hard, even to the extent of even using the digger to dig and pack, shovel, uh, 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 um, uh, lateritic material from the backyard and put on the, this thing for the for my 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 guy uh, my my um, watch night to take out. 
you knew that how we were on this site when at the initial this sorting out iron rods you knew that when we would be doing some casting on this site i will give each one of you according to your age uh, um, um, containers to even pack uh, the, the, the help pack the, the concrete even though I had paid for workers to do them. It's just the, the attitude to people to some work. Some people might feel it's demeaning. I don't look at it that way. I enjoy working on site. I love to work on site. I like building. I built this house from foundation to this I'm, I'm talking about by direct labor. I don't mean supervising it with my bare hands. So really for me, that's where I get my satisfaction from. I like getting home and then stripping down off my clothes and getting into the shower. Those are some of the things that make me happy. And I come at the end of the day and see what I have done. When I was a young lady during lunch hour I will run to the market I like cooking my food since when I was a young wife I had two house helps but all they needed to do was just prepare for me to come and cook because I don't like eating rubbish and I'm, I, won't, I want to believe I'm a great cook so prepare for me to come and cook. Instead of going for lunch, I'll run to the market, pick up things, go and dump them, ask them to prepare. As I'm coming from work, I'm going straight to, I won't even get into the bedroom. I go straight into the kitchen and cook. And I want to remember that even when you guys were growing up, I'll be particularly during your, your, your examination period. I know I'll be teaching this, this, I'll be doing, I'll wake you up even earlier than you should in the mornings. That is after I would have taught you at night and wake you up early and be going over those. Because besides that, that was besides me even getting the kids, your, your kids uh, teachers to teach you. I would also go over those things with you. I think I multitask and I was able to do them effectively because one thing, socials was not too much part of me. I didn't, I mean, parties and all that wasn't exactly my cup of tea. I was more interested in going to work, coming with the kids, taking them lessons in, in, in those spare time, I would go to parties sparingly. Um, as a matter of fact, I think much later, the, the, the boys would have to literally push me out because I would almost like, no, even when I had said, oh, I was going to go to this party, I get back, I said, mm, I, know, I don't think I want to. Remy in particular, my, my last kid, would literally push me up, go and look for clothes I would wear, the, the um, wristwatch to match that, and the water jewelry, because I'm, I'm just not a social animal as such. The important thing was my work and uh, growing the family. I loved cooking, and of course, you remember that uh, Christmas time, I could stay up for as many days as possible cleaning the house myself, which we call it as a, what, a spring cleaning. So it, that was the kind of setting, that was the kind of um, uh, mindset my mother built in me. And I, you, you see, <clears throat> even though I told my mother that I didn't think she was my mother because of the hard way she was putting me through, when I got into America, I saw that I was harder on myself than she was, she ever was. So really, once you give somebody one, some basic foundation uh, training about anything, it's so difficult for you to approach that thing and say it's not there. So it's very vital. I always tell um, people, I remember talking to 
my, my, my son's wife. I said, look, this boy, that's my grandson. Let him start washing his clothes at age two. Even if he's not washing it well, give him the one more, let him waste it. Give him one of his clothes, let him play with it. That way you get him to understand the going through that process of trying to uh, do something, to wash, to clean, to... And I'm quite happy. That little boy, he doesn't want you to brush his teeth for him. Even when he was two, three, I go in there and say, no, Grandma, let me do it myself. So he will do it, and then you do, you, you do the final decision. That is what is missing in a lot of homes in Nigeria. Because we believe we need to spoil our kids, we are so rich, we don't know what to do with money. We can't train our children to know how to do the basic things, to know how to do work. Nobody should feel ashamed working with his hands or her hands. Nobody should. There's nothing to be ashamed of. But you see, we believe once you have money, your kid must not touch anything. So they come out being very sloppy. I'll give you an example, which might embarrass you a little bit. <laughs> no, I won't, I won't name names. I won't name names. <laughs> I won't name names. <laughs> no, I won't. Let, let me say it if you don't. Have it. <laughs> Ever since I started having kids, um, I always had two house elves at home. But somewhere along the line, I found out that my kids were not doing enough work. They were a bit lazy somewhere along the line. Well, I had to fire one of my house elves so that I could get my kids into the rhythm of knowing how to do these things. It was, a, it, 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 it was a shame that it took that long. I used to tell them, oh, don't wash clothes for them. Don't do this, don't do that. But behind me, they were doing those things for the kids. So when I got to know that, I, 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 let, I let go one of the house elves. So I was left with one. I put my kid one i say okay uh, say your dad says you should eat beans every morning there's beans you just warm it and then you know, and scrub the kitchen it was a very difficult thing it was very difficult and of course the kid the kid did not like it oh we almost became enemies because of that and i insisted Actually, it got to a point that even the dad and I almost had altercations because of that. And I said, you are not going to go to school except you did X, Y, Z. You will have to scrub the kitchen floor because my kitchen floor needed to be scrubbed every day. Secondly, you have to warm the food and share. I must tell you, it was one of the most difficult things. That and yes, that kid turned out Exceed, honestly, you see, and that's what I'm saying that parents must look out for. Because today that kid has turned out to be exactly what I wanted. I'm amazed that the fellow had turned out. <laughs> I'm amazed that that kid is Kemi Adetiba, who has turned out to be a marvelous cook that she's not even doing enough cooking to put on her Instagram or whatever. I cannot believe for the life of me that she could get there. And not only that, for me to get inside the bedroom is that, ah, mommy, you can't wear shoes. This was somebody I literally would want to, you know. So I am pleading with parents, you must look after the kids. Don't get too involved in what, nobody can be busier than myself, as a, as a, you know. But then, you must keep an eye on your kids and know that they should turn out the way. I must tell you that I am very happy about the turnout of all my kids, all three of them. 
they are all very hardworking, and sometimes I'm very scared at the amount of work and dedication they give to their. Today, to the, the story I gave was about Kemia Detiba. She couldn't even boil water at age 15. But then when I put her to, you know, she knew that that was the only way out. For her to live in that house with me, she needed to do that job. But I must tell you that she's turned out to be a fantastic cook, a well-disciplined lady, a daughter I am very proud of. Of course, she is very hardworking. There's no question about that. She is extremely, actually, when there, there are times when she's busy, I'm on my titters because I believe she's working too hard. So if I say somebody is working too hard, that means that fellow can work with anybody. That's why I say you can't tell me that because yeah. <laughs> you cannot tell me that somebody else is working too hard. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true. Okay, cool. I've sat down and I've watched all my kids. All of you, you are like me. You don't go out that often. You, you don't go out. Junior doesn't. Remy doesn't. As a matter of fact, Junior's wife will leave Junior at home and go out. That is, you, you see, that's why I was talking about foundation. Foundation is very important. It's what you inculcate in kids today. That's how they will behave tomorrow, in future, even when you are far gone. So you must learn very early to put in place those things that are necessary to form the lives of these kids for the better. So that tomorrow, even when you are not there, they can lead their own lives without embarrassing you without making you feel ashamed of yourself. Because, you know, good name, I must say, even though they don't say it today, is better than any other thing by silver and gold. When I was pregnant, my first pregnancy, I bought a book, every woman or every something, everybody's woman or something, something like that. And that gives you A to Z from your, when you, took, uh, when you take in to when you deliver. So it was like a Bible. And I read from the first page to the end. I don't think uh, I was scared about anything. I don't think so. I don't believe so. And um, I went through it, and it was, I think, I think the most difficult part of it is actually having the baby. <laughs> because, I mean, you, you go to heaven and come back here you know, to hell. You know, but um, going through it and having the baby, it was a lot of fun. I tell you, I would have loved to have even one more, but you know, uh, Mr. Detiba was a very funny man. Uh, you know, you can say maybe he was an Oyibo man, because I had the first kid, and he said, oh, it's enough, it's enough. I said, ah, you think I'm an Oyibo woman? No, I need one more. So I had the next one, and he said, okay, we had the next one. Then I say, ah, can I have a, well, he say, no, I say, please now. I had the third one. So when I had the third one, I said, ah, can I have one more? He said, ah, well, that one, I think you can go out and have that one. I said, okay, if I go out, when I finish, can I come back? He said, no, you can stay there. <laughs> so really, that put paid to it. Well, you know, I come from a large family. My mother had six of us, even though there are only three left. Uh, my paternal grandmother had 13, even though there were, even though there were, is it 13 or 11? There were three, uh, uh, three, three, uh, three uh, twins, so that made it, made it uh, quite a number. So I would have had at least four. The grandkids are different. And uh, you, you, you want to protect them, I think. 
So you tend to have more, uh, show them more love than your, your, your kids. You know, so that's, that's the way I see it. But I still worry very much about my kids, all of them. Aging on its own does not bother me. The only thing that bothers me, because I have this kind of uh, union, will I say, this kind of love for my kids and grandkids, I'm beginning to start thinking that, look, hey, someday, 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 I may have to leave this world and I'll be missing out on the love and affection I had for my kids and which I believe they also have for me. That's the only thing that bothers me. Of course, I feel bad that uh, my covetures are all gone, uh, all minimized, and then I'm having all these uh, arthritis that's killing me, you know. But it comes, I, I, I've come, you know, initially I used to worry that, oh, uh, I have a problem with my eyes. Uh, well, I've done that, removed my lenses and put in some uh, whatever the, the doctors put in there. I can see a lot better, and which is good. You know, done something with my dentures. Uh, then my, my knees, I was to have a knee, I was thinking of having knee replacement until somebody frightened, I think it was Mike and Aoro who frightened me out of it. Uh, so I'm taking my time with that. But age on its own, I believe everybody will get there. So I don't let it bother me so much. The only thing that worries me is, gosh, someday I'll have to bid bye-bye to this world. And that will be the final, final. Even if I wanted to, so badly, I won't be able to communicate with those who are close to me, with my kids, with my grandkids, with Mr. Dejiba, or any, with my friends, you know. So, because I have seen the finality I got from my mom's death, from my dad's death, from my siblings, I know that it is there. And that's why I try as much as possible to embrace my family as much as possible today because I know a time will come that I won't be able to do that anymore even if I wanted to. So that is very important to me. But getting old, I know that I'm just uh, getting out of shape so I accept that. <laughs> you know, when I want to tease my kids, I bring out my pictures when I was uh, in my 20s, in my 30s, in my 40s, even 50s. So it's okay. <laughs> One thing I learned from my mom was that from the very beginning, we were led through one path and one path only and that's Christianity. I have never, I have never been to any, what do you call them, uh, uh, herbalist to look. Even I get frightened. These uh, fortune tellers you see on the street in, in abroad, to even go to them to say, oh, could you, which some people could think that uh, it could be all right. I even feel terrible trying it. As a matter of fact, I went to a Buddha, this thing, to visit a shrine abroad, which was part of the, um, uh, uh, the, the tourist attraction. Uh, you know, you are, you, are a, you are a tourist in the place there. You have bu Buddha shrines everywhere you go. They'll give you the, one of these things. Uh, what do you call them? And you light it and you put it there. And I say, am I not doing the wrong thing? Why should I do this? You know, so really from 
the very beginning, we were all brought up in the Christian faith. We were, and my mother used to tell a story. My dad, even though he never went to church, didn't believe in the, going to herbalist. And my mother used to tell us a story, and we laugh over it. One of my, my immediate junior brother fell very ill when, when we were kids. And they said they should bring one fowl. I think somebody told my mother, oh, there's this man who can cure it, bring a fowl and uh, bring the baby. He said, on our way to the DC, my father just came and yanked the baby away from her, left her with the fowl. So we grew up going to Sunday school. We grew up going to church. We grew up, I'm not a terribly religious fellow where I will say, oh, fire, and then you, 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 you kill, multiply, whatever. I don't believe in, um, sorry, uh, um, those ones. I'm sorry if I'm offending some people. It's just that I, I believe more in the old kind of, uh, old method of serving God the old uh, churches, the, 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 some people get, that, that's where I go. So I go, um, I try to pray, but I must tell you I'm not, uh, I'm not as good as, as I should be. And every day I pray to God, I ask God, please let me know you more and more. And I think that is very important. I won't say I'm closer to God today than I was before, because maybe even ab initio, I tried very hard to, to, to come close to him, because that, that, that was the way I was taught. But I really want to, to up my, my relationship with God. I want to do so. And I'm praying always for, for God to lead me to that. But I try as much as possible to lead a decent life. My mother-in-law used to tell me, he said, when, when a women that come, women from rich homes who stay too long with a man who is giving her rubbish because she's she, you think those who stay they stay because they, they 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 love to stay no because they know that when they get out some of them not all when they do get out that the quality of life they used to enjoy won't be there so they are forced to stay not necessarily because they want to stay, okay? If one is a little comfortable, you have a limit to what you can tolerate from anybody. Go same for women, same for men. A man at work, if, he's, uh, if, if, if the wahala is too much, you just tell you, look, I need to go. You know, so really, I don't know how I picked it up. I have seen a picture of Caroline Kennedy waiting in Wall Street Station to jump into a train. Bloomberg, when he was mayor of the city, would jump into the train. I will say he cannot afford to get a taxi. No, you have to understand something. There are some people who say, oh, I don't want to be caught looking as if I'm poor. Okay? There are people like that. For me, I don't care. I know who I am. Yes, there are times I was even going for a board meet, um, AGM, for either Eco Hospital AGM or Mobile AGM. I think it was more of Eco Hospital on the island. The car, my car was coming with a driver. I was holed up. I said, okay, wait, call. I don't know how many times, even 
even on flight. I'm going to the airport, the plane is leaving in another whatever, and I'm hooked up on the traffic. I'll just tell uh, the driver, I say, you better look for an Okada. Of course, the Okada man will come, slap you, we can say 3,000 or 4,000, you can't believe it. Even more expensive than a taxi. You want to get there because, of course, maybe you are, you, you, you are going to attend a, a meeting somewhere that's scheduled for a particular time. You miss your, your, your flight, you're not going to get there. It's that sense of responsibility that makes you take that kind of uh, 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 rush, or you, some people might think uh, demeaning. You see, and I don't see anything demeaning about it. I'll jump on the Okada. I say, just carefully drive me over, you know, je, je, you know, I put my little this thing in front of them and I hold him very carefully. But again, it's because of the way you want to see yourself. You know, I've tried to train myself to believe that I need to be relaxed with myself. I need, sometimes I want to wear slacks that uh, maybe not expensive and a top that's not expensive and travel with it you see me and i'm talking to a minister with it i must not be seen as a rich woman before i'm if you uh, 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 i'm taken seriously okay the important thing for me is what is up here how can i relate with people how my, it was my trend of discussions with them. Not how much gold I have. So once you have that at the back of your mind, and know it's not what you put on that matters, but the kind of conversation you can have, the quality, the quality of conversation you can have, how you carry yourself, how you carry yourself, those are the important things. Not to me, how gaudy you have dressed, no. And the moment you put yourself in that position, you feel relaxed at any time too. Somebody can come and see you in a t-shirt as you are in with your slacks and feel comfortable with you. There are some people they would not dare do it because they think they must be dressed to their nines at any time, T. I'm one person, I don't believe that anybody should determine my life. Okay? Um, you know, there are some people who say, ah, you know, if you don't marry, yeah, this, 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 and people won't take you seriously. That is not true. What if you were a married woman and you are all over the place sleeping around? Will you get the respect? No. I think the way you carry yourself, the way you, the, the way you carry yourself, the, what you do, those are very important. Of course, I will not by any way uh, put down marriage. If it works for you, fine. But I don't believe we should uh, make it a yardstick for measure. You know, if it works for someone, fine. Marriage is a beautiful thing. I totally enjoyed quite, you know what I mean, marriage is up and down. There were times that they were, it was very fantastic for me, and there were times that they were bad. The, the experience was bad, you know. So really, I cannot, there's, there are quite some beautiful things, and if it works, if it works, it can be one hell of a thing. It can be such a beautiful thing. By 18 in those days, if by 20, 18, 20, 23, you were not married, uh, or you were not bestowed on someone, then. Uh, they, they probably think there's, there was something wrong. But I think we are going through that transition period. We are moving away from that. It's not as bad as it used to be, you know. But then, 
you know, there are still some people who are sick who believe, oh, except uh, you are under lock and key. You know, you, you can't get any respect. It shouldn't be. You know, I think every day I keep on thinking about what can I do to improve the lives of people, of the citizens of Nigeria. I think I'm more into wanting to improve people's lives than remembering me for any other flamboyant things, you know. There's nothing that gladdens my heart than when I see that I'm making some kind of difference in people's lives. I try to see what else can I do. How do I feel by the king woman? Well, you didn't tell me that you were going to do it. I uh, must say that I'm elated, I'm honored. Even though I did not take the title of uh, Obongwan, which if you had to transliterate it is king woman, uh, even though I didn't, uh, I didn't take a uh, pick up the or accept. It was given to me twice, and I refused by the paramount ruler of uh, of, our, of our village. And the first time, my mother was alive, and because I refused it many times, and she, before she died, she said, "Okay, if you don't feel like it, you don't need to take it." But after she died, I was the next paramount ruler invited me. Uh, as a matter of fact, even the wife had to send emissaries to me that the husband has uh, found me fit to be to to bestow on me the title of uh, of uh, Obongwan, which is king woman. And I thanked them so very much, and I said, "Sorry, I don't think." Uh, I mean, I'm really interested in it. I don't mean any offense. And I still, it's not because of anything. It's just that I don't believe in titles I did not earn. I will never be a, a, have a title of chief or anything, no matter what. I'm not caught out uh, with that kind of uh, this thing. I don't, I don't believe in, in taking any title I didn't uh, earn as such. The only thing I am worried about is uh, the fact that um, we are beginning to lose a lot of values. Parents are not paying attention to how kids are being brought up today. And that's not good enough. That is not good enough. Um, I've lived in the US for about six years. And I've seen the way the American society is today. I've seen how the kids there deal with their parents, talk to their parents. Unfortunately, we are beginning to toe that line. And I feel very sad that that is happening. And I wish that parents, both men, both, both fathers and mothers, must pay attention to bringing kids up the right way. One thing I thank God for is that 
I did so much to bring up my own kids the right way. Because several times I've seen people who have spoken to me, who have said to me, ah, your kid was at my place to deliver a message from you. Somebody who was there said, ah, that kid comes from a good home. Just by the way he was delivering messages. I wish to goodness, I'm not all perfect, but we must not spare the rods and spoil the kids. It's not going to work. If we want to sleep in our old age with two eyes closed, we must learn to do, to do what I did to my daughter when she didn't know how to warm ordinary beans and scrub the kitchen floor. <laughs>